All right. We're having better internet connection today, but we're also having technical difficulties with it. But that's okay. All right. Okay. Do I have an echo? Echo, echo. Do I have an echo, echo, echo? <laughs> All right. So uh, let's see. Well, are we good to go, Mark? All right. Okay. Glad to have everybody here with us today. Glad for those of you that are tuning in online and through uh, the YouTube or the Facebook or watching the live stream. Glad to have you. And sounds like everything's good so far, so I appreciate that. It's chapter 3, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And let's see, I've got a, a uh, screen here today, which is a little out of the ordinary. I didn't feel like messing with the projector and setting that whole thing up. So I have a TV screen here. This is the best uh, representation I could find of, you know, Jack Chick and the judgment. He's got that big screen on, on his chick, uh, his track, uh, This Was Your Life, you know. So here's my screen that we'll be dealing with the judgment seat of Christ today. It just makes things a little easier for me to get through the points because I've actually got a lot. We're going to cover a lot of ground today. The title of my lesson today is The Judgment Seat of Christ. Pop quiz. Okay, so we got into some of this stuff last week. But before we dive into this, let's open with a word of prayer. Father, I come before you today and I do thank you for the word of God. I thank you, God, for giving us the truth. Lord, I thank you so much that we do have the liberty in this country to be able to meet freely. And even though, Lord, it's been kind of crazy in this country lately, Lord, uh, Father, you, you really haven't given this country what it deserves. And we're grateful for your mercy still. Help us, Lord, to be faithful, to be preaching your word in these uh, uh, tribu tribulational, t not, not the tribulation, but in these uh, difficult times. Father, help us, Lord, to be faithful and help us, God, to uh, just to get something from your scriptures this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I guess i got to be careful with the words I use. I don't want people to think that I teach that we're in the tribulation or something, because we're not. All right. Fake news. <laughs> yeah, fake exact news. fake news. Fake preaching. <laughs> Yeah, it is exactly not the tribulation, but in the world you shall have tribulation. That's what Jesus said. They've, we've been having tribulation for two thousand for well since the world began practically. All right, but anyway, since Genesis chapter three, so let's move past that and get into the lesson this morning. All right, so last week I gave an overview of the three great judgments in Scripture, and from a chronological standpoint, who remembers what the first great judgment is going to be? Who wants to throw it out there? The first one. It's the judgment of the Christians. The judgment seat of Christ. Oh, oh come on. Click for me. There we go. The, the judgment of the Christians. There we go. All right. So the judgment of the Christians, that's going to take place after the rapture. The rapture is the next big thing on God's calendar. Then the Christians go up. And while the world is going through the tribulation that we were just discussing, uh, the Christians are going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. And then you have the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're going to be up in heaven while the world is going through hell on earth. And then at the end of the tribulation, Jesus Christ comes back with all his saints and sets up his millennial kingdom, which then brings you to the second great judgment, which is the judgment of the nations. The judgment of the nations is the judgment of the people that are still alive during the tribulation. The criteria of their judgment is basically if they took the mark of the beast or not and whether they took care of Jews at that time. And we went over that in last week in Matthew chapter 25. The third judgment, who remembers what the third great judgment was? Uh, the universe. The judgment of the universe, and that's going to be the great white throne judgment where all souls are judged, and that includes judgment of the devil, that includes judgment of the angels, and I presume judgment of the de demons and all that other stuff. Basically, that's the judgment of the universe. So, uh, the, I ended last week with the concept that the judgment seat of Christ is likened to a courtroom proceeding, and the purpose of any judicial trial is to determine what happened and why did it happen? And the way you find out answers to these questions when you're in a courtroom is you present evidence and you ask questions to find out, to get to the bottom of what the truth is. And as I pointed out last week, the evidence that's going to be appearing at the judgment seat of Christ as to determine uh, what is true and what is not true, what you did and didn't do, is going to be those gold, silver, and precious stones that are going to be brought forth, or the wood, hay, and stubble that's going to be brought forth at the judgment seat of Christ. And we went through some of that, and I won't rehash all that this morning. And by the way, we are starting a few minutes late, so if we end up going past the normal time I cut off, don't worry. Um, 
we get to, we don't have to be we we're, we we don't have to be out of here at 12:30 on the dot. You know, we try to shoot for that, but if we're a little bit longer, it's okay. So I just wanted to calm all your fears this morning. I'm not going to go too long, but just so you know. All right. So when it comes to asking questions at the Judgment Seat of Christ, this is what I want to focus on primarily. Um, questions, like I said last week, are a great way for the questioner to discover truth. But questions are also a great way to reveal truth to the one being questioned. And you think about Jesus, he knows everything. Um, he even went on earth, Jesus knew men's thoughts, and yet he still asked questions all the time. Like when he said in John 8, 10, he said, woman, woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? Or he said, or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Question mark. Children, have you any meat? Question mark. Judas, betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss? Question mark. Jesus was asking questions all throughout the Gospels. And the thing, the question that I asked, turn to John chapter 6, is why would Jesus ask people questions if he already knew the answers? And the, the answer to that question is here in John chapter 6. <clears throat> if Jesus knows all the answers, why ask questions? John chapter 6, and look at verse 5. So I'm setting the stage here for the judgment seat of Christ and what it might be like. And so John chapter 6, verse 5, it says, And when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? You know, acting like he doesn't know. <laughs> but it says in verse 6, And this he said to prove him, Philip. For he himself, Jesus, knew what he would do. What See, to, prove to test him out, to oh, prove him, okay. to see, see what he's made of. You know, test his metal, as they say. Okay. Basically, <clears throat> uh, Jesus Christ is going to be our judge. But he knows every single thing about our lives. But I am certain that Jesus is going to be asking us questions at the judgment seat of Christ. When God appeared to Job, God spent four chapters asking Job just question after question after question. And like I said last week, God didn't ask questions uh, so that he could learn something from Job. God asked questions so that Job could learn something about himself that he didn't realize. The questioning didn't reveal any truth to God. God already knew everything. But the questioning revealed truth to Job that Job needed to see. And I believe it will be the same exact type of thing at the judgment seat of Christ. And so the judgment seat of Christ is not so Jesus who can discover who we really are. He already knows that. The judgment seat of Christ is so that we can finally discover who we really are and find out what's down in that heart. All your self-justifications at that time are going to go out the window. We all do things. We all try to justify it in our own hearts and our own minds. You're not going to be able to fool the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ like you try to fool yourself. It'll be you, Jesus, and the truth is going to come out. Were you just acting or were you genuine as a Christian? Obviously, only saved people are going to be at the judgment seat of Christ, but there's a lot of Christians that play the part, but they don't really have any intention of of uh, living for the Lord. And, you know, the questions might, you know, these types of things are going to come out. Were you a Bible believer because you believed the Bible or just because that's what all your friends did? You know, did you leave, did you live to please for your, did you live to please yourself or did you live to please the Lord? Were you after earthly treasures or were you after heavenly rewards? All these type of things are going to be coming out at the judgment seat of Christ. All the thing, all truth will be revealed. But look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and this is just kind of a little bit by way of review, but 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 14, Paul is speaking to the Corinthian church who he was he was not necessarily the founder of the Corinthian church, but he was instrumental in its initial development. For 2 Corinthians 4.14, it says, Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus, 2 Corinthians 4.14, and shall present us with you. That's a reference to the judgment seat of Christ. Paul's saying God's going to present us 
with you. Paul expected to be presented with the Corinthians at the judgment seat of Christ. Obviously, uh, Paul would have his own personal examination, but at some point, the subject of the church at Corinth would come up, and Paul had a great deal of responsibility and accountability for that church. And the people in the church were accountable to each other, and in a way were accountable to Paul as well. And so it makes perfect sense when you think about it, and it's completely reasonable, that Jesus would also present not just everyone, not just individuals before Him at the judgment seat of Christ, but also that groups might be brought before Him as well. The Lord might examine groups of people, this church, that church, this church, that church, and deal with issues that pertain to the entire group. And He might bring other groups such as families before Him. You know, your, your wife, husband and wife, husband, wife, and kids. Because these units are not, the, the individuals in these units are not completely separate from each other. They're accountable to each other and responsible for each other in a lot of ways. So it makes sense that they may be brought together at the judgment seat of Christ in addition to the individual examinations of the judgment seat of Christ. So that's kind of what I want to bring out uh, in these lessons is this concept that I've never really given much thought to. This idea that the Lord might, be, might bring groups together at the judgment seat of Christ, and he's going to have some questions that are going to be pertinent to the relationships of those people in those groups to one another. All right? So, it was this question about the grouping that really made me think about all this stuff. And in 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. All right? So, since this is... This judgment seat of Christ is something that every Christian is going to be a part of. It would really be in our best interest to think about it and try to prepare for that, right? As I pointed out last week, it's appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. We're not going to hit the great white throne, but we are going to hit the judgment seat of Christ, so it would be best to prepare and get ready for it. And so this lesson today is a pop quiz. And what the nice thing about pop quizzes is, is, is this. The score you get on a pop quiz doesn't count towards your final. It's just kind of to let you know where you're at, to kind of find out what you need to improve and get you ready for the real test, okay? So pop quizzes can be uncomfortable, but uh, they're actually good for you. So I'm going to ask some questions that I want you to answer for yourself. Uh, I don't, you don't have to blurt out the answer. I would actually recommend you don't. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, uh, as we go through these, I'm going to elaborate on and give some scripture to go with these things. And I've tried to come up with some questions that are biblical in nature, uh, biblically based, and not necessarily based on, you know, a Baptist tradition or American values. But these are going to be questions that are going to be universal that can apply to any Christian anywhere in the world at any time in history since Calvary, okay? Now, my pop quiz, obviously, is not going to be completely comprehensive, <laughs> all right? And it's not even going to come close to the real thing, I'm, I can assure you. But what I will try to do is I want to try to get your mind focused in the right direction, try to help you examine yourself, and uh, see if I can help maybe prepare you a little bit in case the rapture is today Yay. and the judgment seat of Christ is within 24 hours from now. <laughs> All right, so <laughs> turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, I took that passage in 2 Corinthians 4.14 and it was talking about Paul and the church of Corinth pertaining to groups. But what I want to do is I want to start today with the most basic of groups, okay? And that's going to be uh, the, the original grouping. And that's going to be uh, husband and wife. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. It says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, the wife, according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as under the weak, weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now you see there that it says your heirs together of the grace of life. Heirs is a word that involves the word inheritance. Um, since you are heirs together of God's grace in this life, and since husband and wife are one flesh, it stands to reason that you both could very well appear together before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ as a couple. And, um, and, and give an account of how you lived your life together. Because... You're, you are going to stand individually, but like I said, husbands and wives, the way that they live affects the other. 
So it was very, very reasonable that they'd come together uh, before the Lord. Now, as a quick disclaimer, not everything that I'm going to have to say today is going to apply to everybody, you know, but there should be enough helpful information out of the points I'm going to be going through that everybody can get something from this lesson. So take what's applicable. And if something isn't applicable to you or to your situation, that's fine. Don't sweat it. But I wanted to point out is uh, Adam and Eve were the first married couple in the world. And after they sinned, what did God do? God brought both of them before him, right? Both the man and the woman. He didn't take Adam in a separate room with a little dim lamp and set him at a metal table and slam down a manila folder and say, okay, now tell me what happened, you know, and then do the same thing with Eve and then they're separate, you know, and, you know, and a, 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 the angel standing behind a mirror that's actually a glass that looks through. It wasn't like that. <laughs> the Lord presented both of them together and he asked one, he asked Adam a question, then he asked Eve a question. And he, and he questioned them, right? It was questions to find out what had happened. And so, since God began with Adam, and since the husband is the head of the household, I'm going to start with the husband. So let's say you're standing before the judgment seat of Christ, and the Lord says something, something along these lines. I told you in my word that you, that you as a husband are to love your wives, even as I also loved my church and gave myself for it, right? I want to know... If you loved your wife, and if so, how so? That is a command in my word. You're supposed to love your wife. So how did you love your wife? Did you love her by providing for her spiritually? Now, spiritual things are the most important thing as far as God's concerned. Spiritual always comes first. And so I'm going to start here. The walk with God starts in the home, not in the church. Everyone can put a nice show on for a couple of hours, you know, and can look all nice and look happy and look like a functional family and look spiritual for a couple hours. But what does the home look like? As a husband, you have a spiritual responsibility to lead the home spiritually, and you will give an account for that, I believe, at the judgment seat of Christ. The husband should be the leader when it comes to spiritual things in the home. And your home, you know, when I say this, your home doesn't have to be some kind of weird hyper-spiritual monastery, okay? I'm not talking about that kind of thing, you know? But the question is, is the Lord a part of your home? Is the Bible read by everyone in your home? As the Father, you should see to it that that's the case. Are God's commandments taken seriously in your home? You know, in most churches today, women are the spiritual leaders in the home. I don't... I, I doubt they prefer it to be that way, for the most part. I doubt they prefer that. But most women have just simply recognized the importance of God in the home. A lot of men think they are God, and so they, you know, they don't recognize the importance of needing God in their home. They've got, they've got me. What more do they need? But uh, women, they recognize that uh, their husbands are not God and that God needs to be in the home. And uh, they, consequently, a lot of times have to fill the void that's left by the husband. And being the spiritual leader in your home does not mean that you have to be smarter than your wife when it comes to the Bible. It doesn't mean you have to have more Bible knowledge than her. That's not what I'm talking about. Being the spiritual leader simply means that you, as a husband, as a father, you're in your Bible daily. You're spending time in the Word of God. You're consulting with the Lord daily when it comes to the decisions that you have to make. And you make a daily effort to set the example as to how your family should live, how they should talk, how they should act. You are setting the example. And you accept the responsibility and the accountability for the direction of your home. That's the Father's position. That's the Father's responsibility. And as I said last week, people who are under your care or under an authority's care will perceive God in a similar way as they perceive you. Okay? If you are, un, if you are an unreasonable authoritarian, it is natural that the people that follow you, the wife and kids, will tend to perceive God as an unreasonable authoritarian. If you as the head of the household are unloving and detached from the family, you're, the people that are in your care are going to tend to perceive God as unloving and detached. If you're harsh and mean, the people that are under your care, same thing. They're going to tend to perceive if you're not following God. 
It's impossible. You cannot go in a different direction than God and do wrong and expect things to turn out right. Do you lead, your, lead the home in faith and confidence in God? That's a question. You might get asked of the judgment seat of Christ. Do you lead the home in faith and confidence in God? There will be difficult times. There will be financial issues. There will be health issues and all kinds of issues that are going to come up in life. And you need to be the one as the leader of the home that says, you know what? God is going to take care of the situation and we can trust in God. You set that pace. And your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, is the most important thing in your life. And you can be sure that Jesus will be asking about how your relationship with Him, your personal relationship with Him, translated into spiritual leadership in your marriage. It's not enough just to have a personal walk with God and then try to have your marriage separate from that. It's not going to work. Can you honestly look the Lord in the eye and say that you are providing spiritual leadership in your home because he's going to ask you about it and if you were to and this is like i said this is a pop quiz today if you were to give yourself a grade under spiritual leadership would you give yourself an a an a plus would you give yourself a c a d an f what, what kind of grade would you give yourself if you are only at a b right now let's say what would it take to get you to an a that's the whole point of pop quizzes, is to find out where you're at, what do I need to do to get myself to where I want to be, okay? Because if you're like, if you're, I, I would like to get some A pluses <laughs> at the judgment seat of Christ. I don't know how, if how that's going to all work out, but uh, the, the, the higher the grade, the better, okay? Now, uh, <laughs> I'm not talking about adding a bunch of, you know, religious activity to your life. If you think you're at a B or a C, I'm not saying that, you know, now you have to actions for yourself and try to become this outward hyper spiritual thing. I'm not talking about deeds and performances. I'm not talking about that kind of thing. A lot of times if you focus on the external, you become more like a Pharisee anyway, and that's not going to help your grade with the Lord. But uh, I want you to be thinking when it comes to improving your grade, if you will, be thinking along the lines of your relationship with God. If you get closer to Jesus Christ, you are going to do better at the judgment seat of Christ. The farther you are away from the Lord, the worse it's going to be for you at the judgment seat of Christ. You can think along the lines of cutting sin out of your life, if the Lord identifies sin in your life. Replace wrongdoing with some right doing. How about this? The Lord uh, brings the wife before him, and he says, Wife, I told you in my word that I created you as a wife to be a help meet for your husband. That was the original creation of the wife. She is to be a help meet. I want to know if you helped your husband. And if so, how so? How did you help your husband? Did you love him by helping him? Did you help him spiritually? I think that's a good question. Starting with the spiritual again. Did you drag him down spiritually or did you raise him up spiritually? If you as a wife leave all the spiritual things and all the God things and all the Bible things to your husband, you may not realize it, but you actually are dragging him down spiritually. If you leave all spiritual things, that's his department. You need to be spiritual too. You need to have a relationship with God, too. You know, it's easier for a man to hold his wife's hand and have her walk side by side with him than it is for a man to hold his wife's hand and be dragging her along like dead weight. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just a little easier and a little better and a little more uh, comfortable and, and a little more enjoyable in life if your wife is walking side by side with you, okay, than having to drag her around. But uh, if, if you have a good Christian husband... Okay, a good Christian husband, then he is going to be somebody who loves God and he loves you and is willing to sacrifice for both of you. But if you as a, as a wife have no interest okay, in God or the things of God, then whether you realize it or not, you are putting your husband into situations where he has to choose between doing what God wants or doing what you want. Because believe me, if you as a wife don't have a relationship with God and, and you don't have a relationship with the Lord, your natural default is to do the opposite of what God wants you to do. 
So if the wife doesn't have a relationship with God, she is, she is automatically going to be going this way, and God is going to be going this way, and the husband is going to be standing in the middle saying, which way do I go? Now we know the right answer, but like I said, the heart, it, it loves both God and the wife, if it's a good Christian husband. Do you really want to have to explain to Jesus why you inserted yourself into his place? <laughs> I don't, I don't. I wouldn't want to answer that question. <laughs> you know, if your husband is trying to obey the Bible, please God, and follow the Lord, but you are always in the way, Jesus is going to ask you, why were you in the way? Are you a help or a hindrance when it comes to spiritual things in the home? Do you push your husband towards Jesus, or do you pull him away from Jesus? Believe me, this is a good question for a lot of Christians today. And this sermon, you know, we don't have a large crowd here, but there's a lot of people tuning in, and there's a lot of people that are going to hear this on Final Fight Bible Radio, and that's an, that's an appropriate question for a lot of Christian wives. Are you pulling your husband away from Jesus, or are you pushing him closer to Jesus? You can trust Jesus Christ with your husband. Now, I realize that Christian husbands aren't perfect, uh, but generally speaking, a Christian husband who loves Jesus will treat the wife better than a Christian husband who doesn't love Jesus. That's always going to be... I know, I know there are some exceptions. And I, pers I know of some exceptions, you know, where there's a good Christian husband who believes the King James Bible, loves the Lord, but treats his wife terribly. I know of some, say, of some, some cases like that. But the exception doesn't overthrow the rule. You can trust Jesus with your husband. Jesus' influence will help your husband to be kind to you, to be loving to you, to be faithful to you. And you are a fool to try to pull your husband away from Jesus. You're only going to hurt yourself in the end. So do you help him spiritually as a wife? Do you help your husband spiritually? It's best to be honest and just answer that question now during the pop quiz than to put it off and have to give an answer to Jesus in person. <laughs> Believe me, if you're the kind of wife that pulls your husband away from God, Jesus is going to have some words for you. And you are not going to shout him down. And uh, you are not going to stiffen your spine and your neck. You are not going to do that at the judgment seat of Christ. And you are not going to give Jesus the silent treatment, okay? <laughs> and uh, you are not going to walk, walk away from that conversation and slam the door. And Jesus is not going to be sleeping on the couch, I can assure you. You are going to have to answer the question, and you are going to have to give an explanation for your actions. And it would be so much easier just to do things right now than to have to explain why you did things wrong then. Second question for the husband. Did you love her? You're supposed to love your wives. Did you love her by providing for her emotionally? Now, this one doesn't always come natural for men. I mean, uh, just, just face it. But at some point in your marriage, you should figure out that your wife is wired differently than you and thinks differently than you. And you, as a Christian man, are told in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, you're supposed to dwell with them according to knowledge. So in other words, on a regular basis, we Christian men are going to have to use our brain and sit and think about her and about how she is, and about how she thinks, and about how she feels. You cannot simply take for granted that your wife is just like you. Because <laughs> she's not. Uh, it, it did take me many years to find this out. <laughs> but uh, someday, everybody should figure this out. You know, if the Lord had come back like two years into my marriage, I <laughs> have a lot of answering to do. <laughs> You might give me a pass, like, Matt, you're new when it comes to marriage. But, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but anyway, Amen. do you really, I mean, you, th you, you might be saying, well, do you really think that this is something that's going to come up at the judgment seat of Christ? Why wouldn't it be? I mean, he specifically said to love your wives. Don't you think emotions are going to be a big part of that? I mean, emotional interaction may not be a high priority for you, but it is for her. And marriage is not all about you, sir. It's about her, too. God knows women. As a matter of fact, he's the only male in the universe who does. <laughs> but he does know them. And he dwells with them according to knowledge. Christian women have the Holy Spirit of God inside of them. And, G and you can bet that God dwells with women 
according to knowledge, right? He's not going to tell you to do something that he doesn't do himself. The Bible says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you, right? And that is for men and women. The cares that women cast on the Lord are probably generally different than the cares that men cast on the Lord. But either way, God cares for both of your cares. That's amazing. Not just the man's cares. Uh, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 24. Deuteronomy chapter 24. This is interesting. Because I, I know how it is. This is we, have a we have a male God. We have a male Savior. We have a male Holy Spirit living inside of us. We have a Bible that's written exclusively by males. There's a lot of males in Christianity. That's fine. But sometimes, I, I'm sure that Christian women, I mean, some people even teach that there's no women in heaven. <laughs> you know, that all women turn into males. I, I, for the record, I absolutely, I don't believe that. And I believe I can prove from the Bible that that is erroneous. But uh, regardless, um, the thing that sometimes Christian women kind of get this uh, mentality sometimes that, you know, they're they're not important because there's so much masculinity, you know, and all this stuff when it comes to the Bible and that they're somehow lesser and they're not they're not they're just kind of a side note that that's not the truth. Uh, God cares about the wife's feelings, believe it or not. And so as a man, as a husband, you should, too. Deuteronomy chapter 24, you should care about your wife's feelings. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But it's true. You should. Deuteronomy 24, verse 5. I don't fully understand it, but I'm not told I have to understand it. I'm just supposed to do it. Deuteronomy 24, verse 5. Look at this. When a man hath taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war, neither shall he be charged with any business, but he shall be free at home one year, and shall cheer up his wife, which he hath taken. Yeah, interesting. You know, that's a command from God Almighty. It's an Old Testament command and, you know, not exactly practical in our modern society. I mean, if you could take a, a year off of work, I mean, only if there's a coronavirus can you do something like that. But, I mean, you can't really take a year off of work. But in, in the Old Testament, uh, under the law, th this command was completely from the Lord and for, completely, solely for the woman's sake. And God had her feelings in mind. I mean, really, you read the command, the woman's feelings are the sole purpose of this command. I mean, after uh, one year of the husband being home, you know, she would probably be wondering, what, like, why do we need to write this? Why, why did God even put this in here? But the answer is, God knows women. He is aware of their needs, and He cares for them. They, I mean, really, look at the verse. If you can find something else in the verse that, that's applicable, let me know. But I mean... The whole purpose of the man staying at home was just to cheer up his wife. God wants her to be cheered up. That's amazing. The God of the universe wanted to, hey, I, I'm, I'm going to put this command in here because I know that they'll get married and, uh, you know, he's going to be off to work and then she's going to be at home and by herself and she's going to be miserable. See, so it's not spiritual for the Christian man to bark orders at his wife and boss her around like she's some kind of employee or soldier, okay? She's your wife. She came from your ribs, okay? She didn't come from the heel of Adam's foot. She came from the ribs. And listen, by tending to your wife emotionally, you are shielding her from the devil's temptations, okay? If she's getting all the love and affection that she needs at home, there will be little to no temptation for her to seek it elsewhere. But if the husband fails in that area, it leaves a void for the devil to come along and try to fill. And the devil has all kinds of books, TV shows, sitcoms, and chat rooms filled with his servants who would love to steal your wife away from you. Make sure to fill that void. It's your job as a husband to fill that void and no one else's. And your, wife's, uh, and your wife wants you to fill that void. That's part of why she married you. <laughs> she wants you to fill that void. You're going to have to give an account of how you dwelt with her according to knowledge because that's something Jesus told you to do. So you're going to have to give an account of it. The Lord might just say, hey, I told you in my word to dwell with your wife according to knowledge, right? Right? Okay, yeah. Okay, tell me. What did you find out about your wife? How many years have you been married for? Uh, what makes her happy? Uh, what was her favorite thing to do? What was her biggest worry in life? 
What did you do to calm that fear? What was the date of your anniversary? <laughs> You're just like, uh, <laughs> you don't want to be saying, uh, at the judgment seat of Christ. <laughs> but hey, listen, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Color our eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what color are her eyes? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, blue. I know that answer. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 7. <laughs> How old was she? I'm not answering that question. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. There's a flip side of this coin. The fl yeah, exactly. Flip side of the coin. What did you do, wife? You're supposed to be a help me to the husband. What did you do to help him physically? Now, this one doesn't always come natural for women. I'm basically going to be a broken record here and repeat myself of what I just said, except the opposite. This doesn't always come natural for women, but at some point in your marriage, you should figure out that your husband is wired differently than you and thinks differently than you. And even though I don't have a verse necessarily to prove it, I am going to go out on a limb and say that you wives should also dwell with your husbands according to knowledge. I know, I know I don't have a verse for that, but I'm just saying it's probably good advice. Because in other words, on a regular basis, the wife is going to have to use her brain and think about him. And think about how he is. And think about how he thinks and how he feels. And the wife cannot take for granted that he thinks just like you. Because <laughs> he doesn't. You say, do you really think that this is going to be something brought up at the judgment seat of Christ? Well, why wouldn't it be? He specifically said, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence. Look at 1 Corinthians 7 verse 3. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. That's talking about the marital relationship in that whole chapter. Physical interaction may not be a high priority for the wife, but it is for the husband. And the marriage is not all about you, ma'am. The Bible really does have a lot to say about this subject, so I'm going to be discreet, and I won't go into a big study on it here. But listen, we're not in the 1800s anymore, folks. <laughs> the world is teaching kids things that adults don't even know about. Right. And uh, we, need, we don't need to keep up with the world, but we don't need to act like we're 18th century pur Puritans either. You know, um, We don't need to pretend that physical interaction and love between a husband and a wife and sensuality is a recurring thing, thing, thing in in the book don't pretend that it's not and so Christians often never hear a peep about this subject so consequently they get a lot of bad information from magazines or from the internet I used to have a Sunday school <laughs> Sunday school teacher growing up who said my wife reminded me of this the, the other day he said that he wished the Song of Solomon was not in the Bible because it's got so much sensuality in it oh, it's, uh, that that's the kind of Christian thinking we don't need in the church, you know that. But that is kind of the prevailing attitude almost in most churches. Like you, you this is Truth Bible Baptist Church. You're going to hear things at this church. You're just not going to hear anybody anywhere else. And there's a lot of churches that completely skip this whole subject, and then they wonder why there's so many problems in marriages. And I'm not saying that that's the root of all problems in marriages, but it is a problem. And so listen, wives, by tending to your husband physically, you are shielding him from the devil's temptations. And if he is getting all the love and affection he needs of the home, there will be little to no temptation for him to seek it elsewhere. But if the wife fails in that area, it leaves a void for the devil to come along and try to fill, and the devil has all kinds of images, YouTube videos, and websites filled with his servants who would love to steal your husband away from you. And so it's your job as a wife to fill that void, and no one else's, and your husband wants you to fill that void. That's part of why he married you. Now listen, God is not naive, and the Holy Spirit was not born yesterday. Um, he created man, and he knows how they are, and God knows that a major incentive for marriage is the physical interaction that comes with it. Look at 1 Corinthians 7, verse 2. This is talking about marriage, and so Paul says, Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and every woman have her own husband. Look at verse 9. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Let's just face it, that's part of the incentive of marriage there in the Scriptures. <laughs> uh, burning is not good, and marriage is designed to put out that fire. And God does not rebuke men for having that fire in them. It's natural, it's normal, just like God doesn't rebuke women for being emotional. And, uh, you know, having all these emotions. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just how you're made. And so the wife might not necessarily 
have that same fire or understand that fire, but you would do well to not ignore that fire and don't try to get his fire to match your fire. Uh, the funny thing that I'm, and like I said, don't worry folks, we're going to be moving on in just a minute, but these are important <laughs> information to get. These are things you need to think about and things aren't being brought up in the church. And so these are as a completely biblical subject. So I don't have a problem bringing it up from time to time. But listen, the funny thing about fires is this. You don't put out fires only on special occasions. And you put, you put out fires any time the fires flare up. And the reason why you do that is because fires by nature have a tendency to get out of control if not tended to. And fires have a way of extending beyond their boundaries and causing very much damage. And so wives, you are to be the only firefighter in your husband's life. Amen. Like uh, Smokey the Bear says, only you can prevent forest fires. <laughs> I hope that every Christian woman that hears this sermon never looks at Smokey the Bear the same again. That's going to stick with you forever. <laughs> and so finally, husbands, question number three. You're to love your wife. Did you love her by providing for her financially? Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. These are all important things as pertaining to the marriage that Jesus has a lot to say about in the Bible. So I imagine that he's going to have something to say about it at the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. Now, maybe you'd prefer that I went over the questions that just had to do with your individual walk with God. Like, can't we get back to just, sorry, how many tracks did you pass out? You know, how many times, how faithful were you in church? You know, <laughs> those type of things. But those are the things that all, we, we all know about that stuff. I'm hitting the stuff that, you know, you maybe haven't thought about that has to do with groups. Okay, and you're going to have to give an account for the judgment seat of Christ. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. It says, But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house... He hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. You know, God designed the family unit in such a way that men are to provide for their wives and their households. Now, let me just give a disclaimer, and I think this is important to point out. I understand, and I believe God does too, that there are exceptional situations where a husband cannot provide, sometimes due to health issues, sometimes due to injury, and things like that. Those things happen. I don't believe that a Christian, I personally, am, I don't believe the Bible does either, and I think we'd all agree, you are not worse than an infidel if you are not capable, for whatever reason, to provide for your household. God allowed an injury or an infirmity in your life and is not going to condemn you for something that was not possible for you to do. God is a reasonable judge, and He is a just judge, okay? Uh, the verse here is against the man who can provide for his family, but simply chooses not not to or fails to because he is lazy, maybe because he's too irresponsible and can't hold down a job, or because he's addicted and uh, that's something that his addiction keeps him from holding a job. Maybe he's addicted to drugs, or maybe he's addicted to alcohol, or maybe he's addicted to video games or whatever, but for whatever reason he chooses not to work. Or maybe he'd just rather let his wife work. Now the last hundred years, you know, really think about it, in all of history, the last hundred years is the first time in human history where a woman really could go to work and make just as much as the man or sometimes more. And it's a very strange time that we're in. This, this type of thing hasn't happened in societies you know, like we see it today. And uh, who makes what or who makes more money is not what's important. But the bottom line is the husband should work to provide for his household in some way to the best of his ability and not pass that responsibility off to his wife. That's the key. Even if she does make more money than him. And nowadays you got these commercials. You've probably seen in the commercials where it shows the men there at home doing the kids' laundry. That's what it's getting more and more popular. It's always the women doing the laundry. But now it's the men at home with uh, these biracial families, and they're doing all the laundry. And then, you know, the diapers commercials show men at home changing the kids' diapers and all this stuff. And pampers are appealing to men now. And, it, and it's like, I'm not saying that men shouldn't do laundry or change diapers. I think you probably should. But they should not be at home with the kids while the wife is at work providing money for the household. That's backwards. That's unnatural. And sometimes, I realize, but hey, sometimes you are going to have to take the lesser pay to do what God wants you to do in your marriage. God's will is not automatically whichever provides the most money. And you might have to settle with a lower annual income to structure the home biblically and have the wife raise the kids and the husband go to work. 
<clears throat> so be it. You know, it's, it's good for the husband to work. It's good for the wife to be at home. It's good for the kids to have a mom at home with them. You know, moms are better at being moms than dads are anyway. <laughs> and uh, amen. amen. Now, again, I'm not. Con <laughs> yeah, they sure do. You know, and uh, again, I'm not condemning women who work, you know, especially if there's no kids at home, you know, or if it's necessary to make ends meet. I get that. I really do. And I believe I, I personally believe the Lord gets that, too. I don't really personally see any reasonable reason why uh, a, a family that has no kids, why the woman would stay at home all day. Why not go to work? You know, do something. Volunteer. Then just, uh, yeah, volunteer, do something. But, uh, or, you know, if, if that's what the marriage they want in the family, that's fine. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I'm just saying there's some people that believe that if a woman goes to work, period, that's wrong. And there's no need for that. But uh, anyway, I'm not condemning the women who work. But like I said, if there's no kids at home but, or to make ends meet, I get it. But let's be honest. Do you really need that second income? Or are you just not willing to sacrifice some luxuries? There's a lot of Christian women and Christian families where they say, well, you know, we both have to work. Well, maybe, I, I know there's situations where sometimes that's the case, but sometimes you really don't. You spend about as much in the, the wife's income is about the same amount that you pay in daycare sometimes. So do you really need to have both parents going to work while you're having your kids being raised by the public education system or by some daycare? I mean, really, I'm just being honest. Now, if you have to, you have to. I realize there are situations where they'd love to get out of it if they could. But for whatever reason at this time, it's just not possible. But, uh, you know, the other aspect is you have to, I want to ask these honest questions. Is it really impossible have you spent any time praying and asking God if he would provide so maybe the wife could stay at home with the kids while the husbands work? Is it really impossible or is it that you just don't want to take that step of faith? There is going to be faith involved, especially in the 21st century in America with prices skyrocketing. It is going to take faith for a man to provide the income and the woman to stay at home with the kids. It's not easy. If things that can be really tight and it does take faith you know some families have some great faith and they're not even in the ministry <laughs> they're just trusting God to help them with their finances so they can try to do things the way the Bible has it set up all right so <clears throat> the, the fact of the matter is is this if you're gonna do things differently from the biblical model then you're then you better have a pretty good explanation as to why you did it that way because Jesus will certainly ask you about it at the judgment seat of Christ finally Ladies, did you help your husband financially? You're supposed to be a help me. You say, I thought the way women were supposed to work. I'm, what I'm saying here is just because you might stay at home and don't have an income, that doesn't give you a pass. You can still help your husband financially even if you don't work. Because you can help by not spending all the money on every shiny thing that catches your attention online or at the store. <laughs> you can be aware of your income situation. You know, don't be just blowing all your money and not know what's in the bank account. Uh, be content with what you have and not always wishing that you had bigger and better all the time. That'll weigh on a husband after a while. Statistically, issues with money is the number one marriage buster. The love of money is the root of all evil, and that goes for men and women. Good men who love their wives really do want to make their wives happy. It says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. He cares for the things of the world that he may please his wife. And vice versa, sure. And God doesn't even condemn that. That's natural. You should want to make your wife happy. You should want to make your husband happy. But men can be incredibly vexed by a woman who's never content. Because Christian wives can get their husbands off track from God's plan for their lives by being discontent. There are men that God has called to preach who quit the ministry or they left the mission field in order to make money just to make their wife happy. Because she was never content. Are, are you helping or are you hurting your marriage financially? You have, maybe you have no problem with spending. But what about giving? Do you pro, pro, protest to giving to the Lord because it means less money for you to spend on yourself? Now, believe me, I'm not advocating. I'm definitely not advocating that every last dime in your bank account goes to missions in order to be spiritual. I completely understand that groceries have to be paid, bills have to be paid, and things like that. I'm just talking about in general terms, is giving hard for you ladies to do? Do you encourage your husbands to give to the Lord? 
or do you just kind of want all that money for yourself? That's a good question. Remember, a good Christian husband will care about the Lord and his wife. He should always put the Lord first. But it is so much easier for the husband when the Lord and the wife are walking in the same direction together. It's easier for the husband to get in on that than when the Lord and the wife are going in two different directions. Man, that makes it difficult. It's not, there's a lot of Christians that have to deal with that. And... Uh, to conclude, you might be thinking to yourself, well, I don't know if all three of those questions are going to be uh, asked at the judgment seat of Christ. No, in reality, it'll probably be those three questions and many, 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 many more. <laughs> uh, what you should realize is this. The things that I've touched on today have a direct effect on your relationship with God, your walk with God, and your obedience to God. And it has a lot to do with victory over sin. You can't completely separate your spiritual walk with God from emotions in marriage. It has an effect. Physicality in marriage, it has an effect. Finances in marriage, it all affects your walk with God in one way or another. They are all interconnected, and one affects the other, and therefore they are all important. And it is very possible that they may all be addressed at the judgment seat of Christ. So I recommend that you consider this pop quiz. You know, grade yourself. Identify areas that maybe you need to work on. Get those things fixed now so that you'll be able to get a good grade on your final exam. Let's pray. Father, I come before you today and I thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for the uh, blunt uh, honesty that you have in your book. God, I thank you that you don't beat around the bush with things and we have to try to figure out what you mean about uh, you know, these type of things. God, you're just very clear. You're very plain. And Father, to add things, our own things on top of your word or all that stuff. Help us, Lord, just to obey the scriptures. Help us, Father, to be honest with ourselves. I pray, Father, you deliver us from deception and self-deceit. And Father, I pray that God, the word of God would have an effect on the hearts of your people today. And God, if you've identified 